Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm Scott Miller, and I serve as your host each week. Today is perhaps one of my most uh, exciting interviews of the entire season. We have Carly Fiorina as our guest. Many of you know Ms. Fiorina as obviously the first female CEO ever of a Fortune 50 company at HP. She was a candidate for the U.S. Senate seat in California, went on to be one of the many uh, Republican candidates to run for president in the last election, is a prolific author, speaker, guide, coach. She's a member of many foundations, including her current passion around developing leaders around the world. Mrs. Fiorina, welcome to On Leadership. Well, thank you for having me, Scott, and please call me Carly. Carly, I'll do so. Thank you for the invitation. I'm a bit giddy because obviously I have followed your career for the better part of 30 years. I've read most of your books. Uh, like many people, I followed your tenure at HP, including the challenges you faced there with transforming that company and the board and your, your, your uh, political aspirations since then. I'd love it if you would indulge the audience for the last person who's left on the planet. This is a global audience who might not be aware of your trajectory. Could you take a few moments and walk our audience through kind of your journey, some of your earlier careers, your decisions to enter politics and kind of what you're doing now? And then we'll get into your um, current book, Find Your Way. Well, I won't make this too long, but I will start at the beginning because I was one of those people who would not have been voted most likely to succeed. In fact, just the opposite. I was a goody two-shoes middle child. My core competence, honestly, was parent pleasing. Hmm. I went off to college to a wonderful school, but I graduated with a degree in medieval history and philosophy, which made me unemployable. And because I was a parent pleaser, my parents thought I should go to law school, I did. I hated it and I quit before the first exam. And so now I'm really unemployable. My resume is really <laughs> uninspiring. And so I had to go to work full time doing what I had done part time to put myself through school, which was I was what we used to call a Kelly girl. I was a temporary office staff. I typed, I filed, I answered the phones. It was what you might call a dead end job. And yet I was really grateful for that job. And in that job, two men who worked in this little nine person real estate firm said to me one day, we've been watching you. We think you could do more than type and file. Do you want to know what we do? And that was my introduction to business. And it was also my introduction to that feeling that you get when someone sees potential in you. And I've never forgotten that feeling and the power of that feeling. Eventually I would get an MBA. I would land at AT&T at the very bottom of the ladder in a company with literally 1 million employees. And honestly, my prayer was, please don't let me get fired. But what I figured out along the way, I didn't have a plan to become a CEO. I didn't have a plan to rise in the corporate ladder, although eventually I figured out I was. What I did instead was solve problems in front of me and solve those problems, many of which had been festering for a long time by working with the people who were most impacted by those problems. And what I figured out is that people closest to a problem know best how to solve it, and that solving problems actually changes the order of things for the better. And in business, if you produce results and change things for the better, people notice. Eventually, I would go on to Lucent and lead a, what was at the time the largest initial public offering ever in the stock market, and then of course, uh, was hired by HP as a CEO to transform a company that has lost its way. Throughout that whole trajectory, let me just say that leadership is always about the same things. It's always about changing the order of things for the better, which means it's always about solving festering problems. And one of the things I am reminded of over and over again from the entry level to the CEO suite and beyond, is that problems fester not because people don't know they're there. Everyone knows what the problems are. And it's not even that people don't know how to solve them. Actually, people usually do, particularly if they're impacted by the problem. It's that there is that catalyst of leadership missing because the status quo is powerful 
and managers operate within it, leaders change it. Well, beautifully said. I was captivated with your story. Carly, when you left uh, HP, I don't recall the exact sequence of time. Uh, one of your next bold steps was to enter the California race for U.S. Senate. Uh, you were, although unsuccessful in that, you went on and had, a, I think, a significant impact on the conversation around the role of government, uh, how your vision for California, your role in the, potentially in the U.S. Senate. And then you went on to to run a very viable early campaign for uh, the U.S. presidency uh, against up now the current you know, winner, President Trump. You share a story in your book about the, um, how the New Hampshire primary went and ended and kind of the ensuing maybe 24 hours after that. Would you recreate that story for our audience right now? Because I think there's a powerful lesson to share in that in terms of you know, resiliency and focus and kind of knowing what your identity and path is. Well, first, let me say I've never been a person to shy away from tough challenges or long odds. <laughs> that was true in taking the HP job. It was certainly true running uh, in the deep blue state of California as a Republican, and it was true running uh, for the presidency of the United States. But in my political efforts, I, again, thought about it as a problem to be solved. And mm -hmm. I think the problem we have is too many professional politicians and too many people focused on winning as opposed to problem solving. In fact, George Washington said to us in 1789, the trouble with political parties and politicians is they'll only care about winning. And I think we've sort of seen that and the results of that. In any event, I knew it was long odds to run for the presidency and yet I thought I had something to contribute. But I was clear eyed about how difficult the odds were. And I was also realistic enough to understand that after a relatively disappointing finish in both Iowa and New Hampshire, that there was no path. And so rather than get fixated on the goal, oh, I have to become president, I said to myself, I think I've made a difference. I hope I have. I've run a race I can be proud of. It's time to end it and go on to something else. And I think my team at the end of New Hampshire, they were devastated, my team, but I also think they were a little afraid to come to me and say, hey, Carly, you know, maybe it's time to get out. And so I remember the day after we got home from New Hampshire, my uh, chief of staff, my campaign manager at the time, worrying about telling me. And instead of him having to tell me, I told him and said, it's time to get out. So let's think about how we do that and then how we can contribute going forward. I think the point is you gotta be clear-eyed and realistic about anything you tackle, do the best you can despite the difficulty of the odds, but know when it's time to turn to something else. Carly, the story actually is quite gripping, I found in your book. You go on to talk about how, you know, you'd both, I think, maybe taken the weekend off or a couple of days off or a day off, and Frank Sadler, who was your campaign manager, a well-known, established political operative, comes back to your door and spent a full minute or so prior to knocking on the door trying to, like, get up his gumption and kind of gather his words on how to share this news with you that he thought you should get out. You open the door, you know, fully dressed, ready to take on the world, and you open it and say, Frank, I think it's time we end the campaign. And he was kind of shocked at both your self-awareness, your not bravado, but your confidence. But it came from a point I want you to reiterate, which was winning the presidency wasn't your fixation, right? It was, it was to solve problems. And you were quite um, uh, pragmatic around, so what's next? And I think it's a great lesson. Is there any... Any learning in your life that you might share with our listeners and viewers that brought you to that day to say how you were able to rebound in 24 hours to say, well, if not that, then what next? Well, you know, I think we get confused about what determines who we are, particularly in this technology-driven age. We tend to look for external validation. And I'm I think blessed by parents who always taught me that who we are and what we're worth comes from inside. And so I did not consider my self-worth tied 
to a particular job. Mm -hmm. I think who we are is defined by how we conduct ourselves, uh, the generosity of our spirit, the integrity of our character, what difference we make, what problems we solve, whether we change the order of things for the better. And so, yes, I uh, was, spent all uh, of my time and energy during the presidential race running the best race that I could. And of course, I was disappointed that it had not ended as I had hoped. On the other hand, I always knew that the odds of it, the odds of me becoming president were not all that high. And so I did not take this uh, failure to become president as a, um, I don't know, a, a critique of my self-worth. It is about, I think, all of us are here to make a positive difference every day. And so rather than getting so hung up on my whole persona, my whole life being tied up around this one particular job, I said, okay, there are other opportunities to make a difference and we need to go find them. Carly, it reminds me of a quote, one of our uh, Franklin Covey colleagues, um, Stone Kambadi from Uganda said, uh, he was a uh, uh, rising star for the Ugandan national football team, right? We know it as soccer in America. He was cut down early in his career, injured, and went on to serve a long life, still helping young boys rise up out of poverty and get educated in Uganda. And one of his famous quotes I love, which you'll resonate with, is sometimes a disappointment turns into an appointment. And I think it kind of sums up what you said there was sort of you, okay, so what's next, right? And how do I keep contributing and solving problems? Well, you know, it's such a wonderful quote. Thank you for sharing it. I actually would say always a disappointment yeah. Yeah. can turn into an appointment yeah. if we let it. I think it's all about what we decide to do with that disappointment. I yeah. think we have far more um, control over our own lives than sometimes we want to acknowledge. And I know that each of us has the power and the ability to make a positive difference on the circumstances around us. So if we will let it, disappointment can always be an appointment. It is also true, however, that I've seen people devastated by disappointment. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame because there's so much potential they're wasting their own. Carly, we're going to get into your, your gift, that is the book, Find Your Way, which is one of the many premises. It is talking about uh, a plan versus path. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, because you wrote about it in the book, I felt like you'd given me some permission. I'd like to share one more story and talk about a learning you had in the presidential campaign. Uh, I can tell you where I was standing in my home three and a half years ago or so, when you were on stage for one of the US presidential debates. I think you were the only female on stage running in the Republican yes, primary. in every one of those debates. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Kudos to you for your courage and your, your, um, your path setting for other women around the world. I remember where I was standing, and I say standing because it was such an interesting debate. I was standing up, watching it, pacing around my living room. And I remember the juncture of when now President Trump was, uh, you might say, confronted with some things he had said about you and your physical appearance. It was maybe not for you. For me, it was a defining moment as a voter, as a citizen, as a leader, as a husband, as a father of three young boys. And I don't want to get political or alienate any of our audience. But the facts are the facts, and what was said was said. And you mention it in your book, uh, then-candidate Trump said some things, I think by any modicum of standard, were wholly unacceptable. Said lots of things that had been unacceptable by most parents' point of view. He said some things about you and your physical appearance that should have horrified any parent, regardless of political stature or proclivity or gender. Would you talk a bit about how you learned about the things he'd said about your physical appearance, your, your path to deciding how to address them, and then what happened on camera at the presidential um, debate, which I remember as if it were yesterday, and I will never forget how you handled that. 
Well, let me just start by saying that when I was uh, told by my staff that he had made these remarks, look at that face, look at that face, would anyone vote for that face, something like that, my staff was horrified. And I laughed. And the reason I laughed is not because his comments were funny or appropriate. It's because men have been making comments about my appearance for a long time. So my immediate reaction was, here we go again, been there, done that. Men have made compliments about my appearance or denigrated my appearance, but it's all been for the same purpose, which was to be dismissive. And so it just felt like another one of those. And of course, Trump, as we know, says all kinds of inappropriate things about all kinds of people, unfortunately. However, I knew I would have an opportunity to respond. At the time that he said it, my staff wanted to put out a statement and I said, no, we'll have our opportunity. When I went into that debate, I didn't know, people will find this surprising perhaps, but I never rehearsed lines for a debate. I knew I needed to be prepared to respond, but I also didn't know exactly what I was going to say until I came to that moment. And right before that moment, Donald Trump had said to Jeb Bush, uh, he was complaining about some remark that Jeb Bush had made. And Jeb Bush was trying to defend himself. And Donald Trump said, well, everybody heard what you said. And I knew in that instant that he had given me my line. And so I fed that line back to him. Now, what, what's interesting to me is, of course, most people focus on that moment when I say, I think every woman in America heard very clearly what Donald Trump said. But then following that and the long applause uh, that followed my remarks, Donald Trump looked over and said, well, just for the record, I think she's a beautiful woman and it's a beautiful face. And I would not acknowledge that comment. And the reason I wouldn't acknowledge it is because no matter what he said about my appearance, it wasn't appropriate. It wasn't uh, the thing that should happen on a presidential debate stage. I've had a lot of men ask me about that later and say, well, but isn't it nice when a man compliments a woman and calls her beautiful? And I said, you know, there's a time and a place yeah. for everything. Right. When my husband tells me I look beautiful, I'm appreciative. If a friend tells me that, I'm appreciative. But on a presidential debate stage, when men and a woman are competing on the basis of our ideas and our intellect and our character and our policies, no, no comment on appearance is appropriate. <clears throat> Carly, you mentioned that every woman in America heard that comment. Uh, I want you to know that everyone in America heard that comment. Every father heard that comment. And I'm a father of three young boys, five, seven, and nine. And uh, respect counts and character counts and how you raise your children, what they watch you say, what they watch you validate is very important. So thank you for clarifying, for me, kind of your own um, side of that story, if you will. I, I want to get into the book, Find Your Way. Uh, the opening premise is about this concept that you kind of juxtapose uh, plan versus path. And in it, you kind of call me out. And let me tell you how so, because <laughs> I am one of those, I think, very successful, um, dedicated career professionals that had a plan, had a linear plan since almost uh, high school, right? I plotted out my life from age 18 to age 60. Uh, I said to myself, what I want to do when I'm 60, and I backed it in in five-minute intervals, or five-year intervals, not five-minute, five-year intervals, and I put my age and I put the title that I wanted. And I actually dedicated a uh, income level, each one. It almost was like exactly the model you were talking about in the book. But you kind of debunk that a bit and say, you know, you talk about the challenges with having a plan and the benefits of having a path. Would you riff for a few moments? And you don't, you don't denigrate the idea of, you know, the value of a plan. But talk a bit about the, the frustration and maybe some of the unfulfilling outcomes of a fixation on plan versus path? Well, first let me say, Scott, that my guess is there have been a few surprises in your life. And my guess is that you were open to those surprises. You sure. just strike me as that kind of guy. Yeah. So I don't know all the details of your plan, but uh, my guess is you deviated occasionally. 
Uh, and that's sort of the point. Look, of course there are reasons to plan uh, for certain things, but what I have seen too often is that people get so fixated on sticking to their plan or so wedded to the destination at which they must arrive by a certain point that they miss wonderful opportunities in front of them or they miss a surprise in their life that actually is very positive or they miss a whispering in their ear that says, you know, maybe I should turn slightly to the right or slightly to the left. And I've also seen people who get so fixated on a destination that when they actually get there, they become disappointed. It's like, oh, I've been planning for this for so long and now that I've achieved it, it's not exactly what I thought. And they get disappointed. Or I've seen people who get so fixated on a singular goal, a singular destination, that they give up too much to get there. They give up what they believe in. They give up family. They give up character. I mean, we all know what happens when leaders get too fixated on a single goal, like stock price, for example, or politicians get too focused on a single goal like winning. And it's the same in life as well. And then sometimes, of course, people who get really fixated on a destination or a plan, they don't achieve it. And then they're devastated. And so when that disappointment comes, they can't see the appointment that's there because those, they're so devastated by their failure to achieve their plan. Now, I happen to be a person who had a plan. I was gonna go to law school. I was gonna be the parent pleaser. I mean, I had it all worked out and guess what? It didn't work because I hated law school. And I never had a plan to become a CEO by a certain age. I didn't have a plan 10 years in advance to run for president. That's not to say that life should be an accident. There are times and places when one needs to be deliberate and thoughtful, but life is also a wonderful adventure. Mm. And there are times when we have to be open to a surprise and open to veering one way or another. And uh, the people that I've seen who make the biggest difference are those people who will take their eyes off the distant prize, occasionally at least, and look at what's right in front of them, where they can make a huge difference. Carly, you opened the book uh, challenging some conventional wisdom around this idea of you know, plan versus path, and it has me thinking a lot about my path, right? And, and how <laughs> does my plan kind of become my path, especially as a parent, which is my primary I think, role in life now, whether I want it to be or not, <laughs> you know, with my three small boys and my marriage. Uh, you talk a lot about this idea of fear and the role that fear plays in maybe preventing us from uh, pursuing our path. And you debunk this idea of fearlessness. Would you talk a bit about why you wrote so much about fear? And you share several stories, and I would invite you, if you would maybe expand on the story of one of your many philanthropic and charitable um, investments with your time and your talent and your, I'm, I'm guessing, assets as well. The story about the job fair with wounded warriors, it really struck me to move outside of my own kind of fearless paradigm and be a little more empathic to others that obviously are gripped by fear. You, it's a compelling chapter. Would you recreate some of that for our listeners and viewers? Well, yes. First of all, one of the goals, one of the methods to stay on the path is to be the best version of ourselves and to be a leader. And that is the point of the book as well. And so to be the best version of ourselves, we have to have courage and we have to have character, which means courage over time and integrity over time and conduct worthy of ourselves over time. We have to be willing to collaborate with others in order to change the order of things for the better. And while we have to be realistic, we also have to be optimistic enough to see possibilities for things getting better. And I talk about all that in the book, but I always start with courage, how important courage is, because it turns out that everyone's afraid of all kinds of things. We're all afraid, sometimes stupid things, sometimes profound things. And to the point of your story, we do a lot of work with the Wounded Warrior Project. We're honored to do so. And of course, when you meet these wounded warriors, you think, oh my gosh, they cannot be afraid of anything. I mean, they've, they've made it through combat. They've 
done all these amazing things in service to our nation and on the field of battle. And now they have dealt with, come back from grievous wounds, either wounds that are unseen or wounds uh, that are seen of the body. And they're carrying on. How can they be afraid of anything? And this particular story, we were working with the Wounded Warrior Project and they were expressing disappointment that they have on a regular basis job fairs where they have all these wonderful companies that want very much to hire wounded warriors. And so the companies come and they hold these big job fairs and there are all these potential employers lined up and inevitably they don't get as many wounded warriors as they expect. In fact, Sometimes they expect 100 and they get 10 or 15. And so in this group of Wounded Warrior staff and Wounded Warriors themselves, I asked a question. I said, what are they afraid of? Because in my experience, when people are not taking advantage of an opportunity right in front of them, when they can't see the appointment, to quote your Ugandan friend, it is so often because they're afraid of something. And a woman raised her hand and she had been, uh, she was a wounded warrior herself. And she raised her hand and she said, I'll tell you what we're afraid of. We're afraid of going to the job fair and nobody wanting to talk to us. We're afraid of going to the job fair and not getting the job. We're afraid of going to the job fair and getting a job and not knowing if we can do the job. We're afraid of going to the job fair and being pitied instead of being valued. All those kinds of fears, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna look foolish, no one's gonna like me, I'm gonna be pitied. Those are real human fears. And it turns out even the most valiant among us, our wounded warriors, our veterans, are also afraid of things. And so what I've found in life is that sometimes it is those lesser, uh, maybe foolish fears. It's not the fear of getting killed in battle. These guys and gals have gotten through that. It's the fear of being pitied, the fear of not getting chosen, the fear of failing. We all have those fears. And so until and unless we can get over our fears, move past our fears, we will not be able to have the impact that we want, and we will not unlock our own potential. Carla, you can see from the set, I read a lot of books. This is a curation <laughs> of some of my favorite books that I've read. All of them, I think, are nonfiction. Some of them are political memoirs. A lot of them are uh, CEOs like yourself that have written retrospectives, if you will, on their lessons. Any great book has a commonality, which are these rich stories that we may not be able to relate to always, but they're inspiring and they're introspective. You share another story about one of your other philanthropic endeavors around micro lending and such, this story about this particular woman in India. I'd love it if you take a couple of minutes and kind of recreate it step by step because it will impact my life forever as you kind of walked through the, the change of you know, generational uh, oppression, if you will, really, and prejudice. And one woman's life is changed for you know, uh, vastly better. Walk us through this story. It, it's it's life-changing. So let me tell the story first, and then I'll explain why I included it in the book. Uh, I served as chairman of an organization called Opportunity International, which at the time was the world's largest private micro-lender. Micro-lending is, of course, the loaning of very small amounts of money to very, very poor people, along with entrepreneurial training, so that people can stop living hand to mouth and actually get some credit and start to build a business. And at the conclusion of a global board meeting, which we had held in New Delhi, India, uh, I asked to visit with some of our clients. Our clients are very poor people, and so we had to travel to where they lived, which was the slums of New Delhi. I'm not sure how many of your listeners have ever been to the slums of New Delhi, but they're pretty grim places. Yeah. Uh, they are, uh, you see mountains of trash and marauding animals and sewage in the streets and people just piled on top of each other. And I needed to get to a rooftop to meet with 10 of our clients. And so I climbed up this rickety ladder. And honestly, I will say that I was stealing myself as I climbed 
because I saw desperate circumstances. And I was really quite convinced that I would see desperate people because their circumstances were. And yet when I sat down on the top of this roof and looked into these people's eyes, I didn't see desperation. I saw hope, I saw pride, I saw focus, I saw determination. Because these were people who had decided, despite their circumstances, that they were going to change the order of things for the better in their own lives and in the lives of others. And one woman I remember in particular, I can still see her face, although I don't recall her name. And she talked to me about how her family told her no. She wanted to take the loan. She wanted to receive entrepreneurial training. She had seen some others in this community do so. And her family was living in desperate poverty. And yet, in her culture, women did not do this. They endured, they managed, they did the best they could, but it wasn't their job to change things. And so her husband said no, her parents said no, her in-laws said no, and for a year or more, she said no. And then finally, she decided, she gathered her courage, and she said, I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna change the order of things for the better. And she took the loan and I said to her, how does your family feel now? And she laughed and she said, oh, they're all very happy they work for me. I tell that story because it is an example of courage, but more than that, it's an example of leadership, of the potential of each of us to lead. We are not determined by our circumstances, although our circumstances can hold us back. But if someone will give us a chance, and we all need a chance, we all need a helping hand. I needed it from those two men many years ago, and she needed it in terms of a small loan. But if someone will give us a chance and a helping hand, each of us have the potential to be more than our circumstances. And she certainly was. She had the courage to say, I will lead. I will change the order of things for the better. I will solve the festering problem that is mine to solve, which is that my family is living in desperate poverty. I can make a difference here. And so when people tell me they can't lead, I tell that story. And I say, no, in fact, anyone can lead. Leaders are made, not born. Leaders decide to change the order of things for the better. And to do so, they have to find their courage and have the character to keep going when the going gets tough and the going always gets tough and to collaborate with those who can help them. And they have to see the possibility that things actually can change for the better because that's what leaders do. And that's what this woman did for herself and for her family. Carly, I mentioned the book is a gift. It's Find Your Way, Unleash Your Power and Highest Potential by Carly Fiorina. Carly, I'd love to have our last couple of minutes Focus on you maybe giving some extemporaneous leadership advice to men and women. You know, as the first female CEO of a Fortune 50 company, HP, no doubt you and mentioned that you've been the uh, probably beneficiary of and the recipient of uh, detractors and supporters because of your gender along the way. There's a sea change, I think, of positivity happening in corporate cultures across America where uh, unconscious bias is being talked about and uncovered and people of different genders and, and sexual preference and age and handicaps and, and a race are being uh, invited to the table, right, to have a conversation, be part of the solution. What advice would you give to women, and then perhaps separately, from a gender perspective, what can women do to better find themselves being heard and promoted in the workplace? And what can men, who by and large still control much of that power and influence, do to be part of the solution and not perpetuate the problem? Well, that's a big topic, but let me say first um, to women or to anyone out there who's different, it's different when you're different. It's different when you're different. The scrutiny is different, the commentary is different, sometimes the expectations are different. And so it's important to decide, and I think this is a decision, it's important to decide, I am going to bring all of who I am to the table. Because it's only when we bring all of ourselves to the table that we can unlock our own potential, be at our best, 
and help others to be at their best as well. And so what I would say is don't let others' expectations determine who you are. You choose that. You decide that. Now, it's also true that there are people who will tear you down and people who will lift you up. And so my advice also would be look for the people who lift you up. They're, they are always there. There are always detractors. There are always critics. Look for the people who lift you up. They're there. And don't get the chip on your shoulder about the people who are detractors. What I would say to women is don't let others decide how brave you're going to be or how smart you're going to be or how vocal you're going to be. You choose those things. And if someone has a problem with who you are, let it be their problem. Don't take it inside and make it your problem. I'll, I'll give you some data, which maybe is a little depressing, but I think we have to be clear-eyed and realistic here. Yes, more people are being invited into the conversation. And yet it is also true that corporate America spends about $8 billion a year on diversity training and the stats haven't moved very much at all. And I think it's because this is beyond respect. Of course, we need to respect people for who they are, all of who they are. And of course, we need to invite them to the table and include them. But the truth is this, it is easier to work with people who are just like you. It's easier to have a conversation with somebody who understands you and can finish your sentences. It is harder work to collaborate with people who are different. It is harder work to find common ground with someone who you may not always understand and always agree with. And yet the data is also clear that diverse teams produce better results. And so what I would say to men is don't get confused about respect or inclusion being the end point. Of course, be respectful. Of course, include. But you're not going to achieve the best results possible unless you actually are collaborating with people and valuing what's different about them, their different perspective, their different point of view. When you're doing that, when you're collaborating and working with people who are different than you, and yes, it's harder, then you're going to achieve the best results you can. Carly, as the host of this series, uh, 100 interviews, I often get critiqued online that I gush over our guests too much. <laughs> uh, I, I'm long since over the brush with celebrity. I want to tell you, it's been an honor to listen to you today. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, Find Your Way. Thank well, you I hope for it's going to be on that bookshelf. Well, you're going to be on, I promise. I'll, I'll, I, I will take uh, one of our, my lesser favorite books off and put yours on. You have, right, I'll give you a space of honor. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Speaking of path, what does one do after you've been the first you know, female CEO of a Fortune 50, run for Senate, run for president? What's your path look like going forward? Well, honestly, my path is what it's always been. Uh, I put one foot in front of the other and try and solve the problem that's right in front of me. I hope I always lead every day, which is to say, change the order of things for the better. And what I'm very privileged to do now through Unlocking Potential, my foundation, as well as through my business, Carly Fiorina Enterprises, is to work with leaders and potential leaders all across this country and in communities uh, everywhere in this country to help people find their own potential for leadership and to help them then collaborate effectively with others. We have a lot of problems in our companies, in our communities, in our families, in our world. And for me, that means we need more problem solvers, which is to say we need more leaders. And I know that leaders truly are made, not born, and that each of us has the potential for leadership. And so I hope I'm making a positive difference every day by inspiring and equipping and preparing people, especially those who perhaps think it's not their job or their destiny to lead, equipping those people to lead and change the order of things for the better. Carly Fiorina, let the emails fly my way. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege to be in your presence today, if, if I'll be virtual. Thank you for joining us. Your book is Find Your Way, Unleash Your Potential and Highest, or Unleash Your Power and Highest Potential. Highly recommend it. Best of success to you. Thank you for your contribution. 
Thank you so much, Scott. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today. This one is for the record books. Carly Fiorina on On Leadership. Thanks for joining. If you're not subscribing, visit franklincovey.com. Click on On Leadership, weekly newsletter, complimentary. Every Tuesday comes out. You can subscribe yourself, your family, your friends, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, whoever you'd like. We'd love to have you join now what is the largest follow to subscribe to podcast dedicated to leadership in the world. On behalf of the Franklin Covey Company, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.